guys, before enjoying this chapter, just make sure to like it, share it, and subscribe to our channel. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so, how are you really doing? I'm doing great. Alhamdulillah. That's such a quick answer. Of course. <laughs> how are you really doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm always good. That's. I'm I don't like good. always, Nora. But you. I don't like two words. Always, never. Okay. But why not always is positive. Negative is never. Never is negative. So Nora is never negative. No, I am negative, so it's, it's obviously. But. Why I say always good is because we gotta like channel that. If we don't channel that, mm. then it's so easy to like get I diverted and that I agree. not be good. So not being good is very easy. Being oh. good is not that easy. So you have to really put that effort. Mm. So Ashen Hick, that's why you gotta say like always good. <laughs> I, I like what you said because I think um, some people, you know, sometimes they'll tease us or they tease people who are positive and say, oh, you're always optimistic, you're always positive. Right. I'm it's like, yeah, corny. But with all the shit that you go through, if you still decide to be positive, good for you. Yeah, 100%. It's not easy. It's so easy to no sit down way. and complain. Definitely. Because everybody, you can sit down here and give me 50 reasons why you should be upset. I think the reason why I avoid that is because I know um, as a role model or as a public figure, I know there are millions, possibly billions of people watching me. Could be in this interview, could be on another interview. It could even be on my Instagram, right? Or my vlogs on YouTube. I know everyone's going through something. Like I know there's so many problems and everyone has their own story or everyone's going through shit, basically, like no filter. No filter. And when they're watching someone like me, I could possibly be a source of some sort of positivity or a source of some sort of inspiration or just something to brighten their day, even if it's for five minutes. So I don't like to take those opportunities or chances that I have by adding more shit <laughs> onto people's lives. Like they shouldn't see me and be like, oh, our lives are shit. We're going through so much. She's also going through shit. Life is shit in general. Like F this, you know, I don't want that. Although I go through a lot of shit myself, but I don't want that to like be me. Like I don't want that to be who I am. I don't mm. want that branding. I want to always try to uplift people because I didn't have a lot of people uplifting me like growing up and I don't want to be that person for other people. I might not even know you, you know what I mean? You could be sitting somewhere in like Vietnam and watching me. But if I'm even like 1% of that like source of positivity, where I can uplift you even for like five minutes. Like I want to be that person. Like when I die, I want people to remember me like that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so you'd say that when you were down in certain moments in your life, there wasn't that person that could have been you. Like I, there was a period um, in my life, like when I was chasing my dream, where I had that one person that was very uplifting. Mm. And like without her, I don't think I would have been able to conquer my vision. But there were times way before, like when I was way, like way back, like in Canada, when I lived in Canada, when I started to try and figure out how I can make my dream come true or how I can find my calling. That time I met a lot of people that were so negative and they put me down, they bullied me, or they, they could have, if I didn't have, if I wasn't sensible, they could have made me become a very, um, very cynical, girl mm. like someone who would have looked at the world in a very negative way and would have thought like all humans are bad all men are bad and all women are wicked like that that's what could have happened to me and that don't and if i think that would have happened to me i don't think i would have you know did what i did today i wouldn't i wouldn't have traveled across the world to a foreign land where i didn't know anybody i didn't have any family ties no friends no nothing and took that up as a challenge and had so much self-confidence and belief in myself. So th I don't want other people to feel what I had felt that yeah, time. That's what makes sense. Though. Yeah, definitely. 
Who are you, Nora? I am a very emotional, hyper person, I would like to say. <laughs> I don't want to say I'm an actress, I'm a performer, an artist, because that's like, that's a plus, right? But who I am internally, I'm crazy. Like, I'm hyper, I'm hungry, I'm so ambitious. Sometimes my ambition scares me because, like, I'll hear myself talking or I'll think some things and I'll be like, why do you even want to do that to yourself? Like, why don't you just be normal and like go to a beach, sit at home, eat food, enjoy life? Why do you want to do like, why do you want to have, why do you want to be a dreamer? You know what I mean? Like that's a little intimidating. I intimidate myself sometimes because I'm like, why was I even born like this? <laughs> it just complicates things, but I am, th this is me. Like I'm a dreamer and I'm so ambitious and I'm so emotional. Like, I, I give you an example. I was a judge on a dance show called India's Best Dancer in 2020. And I would have to f hold myself from crying. Like, why am I even crying? I don't even know. Like, they've done a, a performance. Like, they've just performed a beautiful act mm. in whatever dance style it is. And I would find something in that that would make me cry. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? Or some, a dancer or a performer on stage would tell his story, right? And I start crying. Like, this is the most emotional thing I, that's ever happened to me in my life. I don't know. I'm just such an emotional person. And in I, that specific example, it's because you empathize. You've been there. Yeah. You've been I on think, the other end. But I, sometimes I'm like, let me just compose myself. Like, let me just be professional. <laughs> you know, I just can't. I can't. It's Shouldn't. so hard. It's so hard. Yeah, I know. It's And sometimes I... I also like I'm very hard on myself so I'll see something I'll be like okay don't be over don't do extra <laughs> you know sometimes like back in the day in high school we used to always make fun of the girls that were so extra like you are extra like I didn't want to be that girl right <laughs> but it's I have just grown to be an emotional person mm -hmm. I see something I see someone suffering I see um just things in the world and they make me so emotional and angry and I remember like I look back at when I was growing up like in high school I was always that girl like who would face other students in our debate like we had debate clubs and um, in our social studies classes and stuff like that we would talk about certain topics and global topics used to piss me off like I would just be so vocal about it and emotional and I didn't know how to accept someone else's opinion I don't know why I was like that. And that fire in me, I'd be like, no, you are wrong. And this is why here are the facts. And I didn't understand how someone else couldn't sim sympathize or mm. have uh, those emotions towards suffering in the world. It used to make me so angry. And there was a point where I'm like, I'm going to become like a lawyer, you know, and I'm going to defend all those people suffering, especially kids. Like I hate seeing kids suffer. Mm. It's like my weakness point. And Obviously, that, that just changed and I became something else. But for a moment, I wanted to, like, solve the problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know how to explain that. No, makes sense. And there was a moment like that. Yeah. And then I, I realized it's too much, like, on me. And I want to just be happy and I want to celebrate. So I think mentally what I did was I realized the suffering in the world and the hypocrisy in the world, especially within the, the the cultures that we have and the different nations and tribes, et cetera, et cetera. And I like the political way, yeah, diplomatic way. Yeah, diplomatic it. way. <laughs> and uh, because as much as we, we want to run away from that, but that's like deep rooted in yeah. our lifestyles globally, yeah. right? And it affects, it's a, it's a ripple effect. So I saw that and I said, I need to do the total opposite and make people happy mm. and i think arts like the world of arts whether it's music dance cinema it's an escapism out of this environment yeah. mentally you can like for example i could be so sad or so like upset with what's happening and i see someone dance and it could be such a beautiful dance choreography with like this kind of music it could be any style like any style it could be ballet it could be cramped 
two different like different styles of dance, two different emotions, but that could just make you feel certain emotions and hyped up and you feel so good. And, you know, a dancer can make you feel like feelings that you without speaking. And I just find that such a beautiful thing. Yeah. Or I could see a film and then I could just my, my way of thinking changes, my my mentality changes or I could hear music and just be like, wow, like God created talent. You know, like that's such a beautiful thing. Like, I feel it's so unfortunate. What makes me so upset and why I'm very vocal. Like if you see all my interviews or anytime I have a platform to speak, I always speak about dancers. I always speak about music, art, 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 art. because unfortunately, the idea of art has been suppressed in a very like in some smart way. I don't know how, but through so many ways, like whether it's through um, upbringing or culture, traditions, religion, schooling, whatever it is, art hasn't ever been uplifted the way it should be uplifted. And that never made sense to me because mm. I always said, but art is a form of positivity. It's powerful. It's so powerful. It makes people feel good. It it lightens up. It 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 can empower people. It's such a source of positivity. Why do we not uplift it? I don't understand. Like, why no, do we tell our kids? At, no, no, sorry. Huh? Look at uh, sports, mm -hmm. music, mm -hmm. movies. Mm -hmm. The most popular people online or in the world come from these fields. Why? Because you don't need a language. Yeah. I can listen to an Urdu song and I just like it and, and I'll save it on my it. playlist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't need to know with understand. Power. It. Yeah. So you said powerful. something, why do we tell our kids? I said, why do we tell our kids like you you can only be like a doctor or you could be a lawyer or a teacher or I don't know, like why do we only say That's that? old uh, school uh, thinking now. Yeah, but you know it's funny, I used to think it's an an Arab thing. Like a no, it's Arab Asian it, and African, maybe it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Like, to be very yeah. honest with you, I've, I've traveled the world, I have multicultural friends, and everyone's got the same story. It's because <clears throat> Nora, the generation of our parents and our grandparents, had um, limited uh, jobs. Yeah, yeah, it was engineer, doctor, lawyer, things like that, and that equaled stability and success so you can't blame them for being mm -hmm. programmed that yeah, they way. didn't know better now yeah yeah the next generation us and uh, the kids mm -hmm. and the kids mm -hmm. they know you can be a professional footballer or a dancer right yeah you yeah. can earn a living probably better you than you can a we know now obviously but there is a stigma attached yes whatever you want to say you can yeah. say i'm open-minded i'm liberal i there's a stigma there attached is. and i want to work towards removing that stigma mm. because one plus one is two right so how is something positive and uplifting and powerful can have an, a stigma attached? It doesn't make any sense to me. And everybody's watching, but they'll still make, make fun it of it. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like I have, this is so funny. I've met certain like fans or admirers, let's say admirers, that are like, I've seen all your songs. I've seen all your choreography. That hook step is my favorite thing. This, this film that you did, you did this role, this scene is my favorite. But they're the same people who tell their kids like never no, be a dancer you can't no yeah like can be as far as uh you can't wear a certain outfit or you cannot dance in a certain song mm. or a certain style that's hypocrisy very contradicting it's hypocrisy very and we have a problem we have a big problem it's hypocrisy mm. and i faced it in my family also and i faced it in um you know the places i lived you know, and I couldn't, I just couldn't accept that. And it made me challenge a lot of ideals and ideologies and things that people said. It made me challenge a lot of men like that I came across, whether it was men in my family or men in my workplace or just men I came across in, in terms of the journey that I had from Canada to India to becoming, you know, a public figure and traveling globally to do work, I always would bump heads with men, always. And I didn't understand, like, I would say to myself, why are you looking for problems? Like, can't you just be normal? And like, don't pick on certain things. And I just- That's, It's you. It's me. You it's should me. not, There's you no... stop saying normal because normal is boring. It's like vanilla ice cream. Basically. You need to be a chocolate chip or- Yeah, like but you know what, I'll tell something. you where this comes from. Like growing up, me and my mom, like we used to bump heads because I used to always argue 
And I, but why is it like this? She'd be like, Khalas, why are you asking why it's like this? It's like this. But I'm like, no, but I want to know why it's like this. Mm. So my mom would be like, why you want to be so difficult and like just live normally and stop asking, be a good girl. And I'd be like, no, like it just doesn't make any sense. Mm. And that's probably from my childhood. And then she'd mm. be like, be normal. Absolutely. You know, so that's yeah, stuck us. in my head. I'm like you. Yeah. If something doesn't make sense, I can't just be okay with it. Yeah, and I get like explain angry. to me if it makes sense, I will shut up. I'll be convinced. Right. No, it, this is a little other. But to tell me, no, don't question. Just, just stay quiet and go with the flow. Right. No, no. this is like considered rude. Yeah. I know. And your upbringing so is wrong. So how was your childhood? It was so. Uh, what's the word? Like I want to say it was like a roller coaster. And then there was a point where I was very upset about like how my childhood was. But now as an adult, when I look back, I'm like a lot of the things that happened in my childhood was necessary for it to build me into who I am today in terms of um, my mentality, the way I view life, um, the way I feel, like the emotions that I have, my ambition, and just becoming like Nora Fateh, who I am today as a human, was because of like my upbringing, my childhood, the things I went through, the things I saw, the things I heard, the feelings I felt. And I think my struggle was always with my culture. I think I, I was, I, I, it, it was almost like I didn't feel like I belonged. It's the problem with that whole melting pot idea of you take like two people who come from a background like immigrants and they go to a different part of the world and it's always like going to the west and then you have children and then the children grow up in the west mm. and they it's just like i don't know if you saw the show rami of course it's I, like I that it. yeah i saw rami and i laughed and i cried and everything because i'm like oh my god i went through the same thing and a show like Rami is so important. And it's very important. So important. Everywhere I go, I'm like, hey guys, watch Rami, watch Rami, watch Rami. Even though they may not connect to like a uh, um, Muslim Arab in a Western country, but there's some subliminal um, lessons that can be learned. And I went through that. Like I struggled so much to live in a Western country, being born in a Western country. And then you go home and it's like something else. It's a different uh, way of teaching and upbringing. And then you go to school and it's something else. And then you mix with different people and it's a cosmopolitan environment. And you have friends of different religions and different backgrounds. And you obviously you're a sponge. You suck everything as a child, you know, and then you go home and it's something else. It's like, haram, 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 don't do this, don't do this. Ay, 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 ay. And then you're just like, okay. And then you leave the house and everything is normal. You just, it's another level of confusion. Yeah. And you really, like, there was a point, Anas, I'm not even going to lie. I didn't think I belonged anywhere. I didn't belong in Morocco because I was never born and raised there. And Morocco, like, my Moroccan family, like, my extended family, whether it was, like, grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, cousins, they lived a different life. Their mentality was different. We used to go there only for vacations, you know? And then I I would talk like in my language and they like, it's like, ah, oh, she's like the foreigner, the foreigner, because obviously like you never sound like a local, right? Like Correct. you always have that Western a- a- angle to you. Then you're in, when you're in a country like Canada or America, you're never really Canadian. You're never really American. It's like, where are you really from? You know, I'm like, I was born here. Yeah, yeah, cool, but where's your parents from, right? So you're just like, how does that even matter, right? This is for me, this is where I am, this is mm. my home. But they always want to question your identity. And then I made things worse. And I left Canada, I went to India. <laughs> you know, even that I added like the layer of complications in my life. Mm. And go. And the thing is like growing up, I always had this identity crisis. Like I didn't know what I am, who I am, but I knew one thing. I like to dance. I like to act. I like to go on stage. I like to perform. I like to make people laugh. This much I knew. Mm-hmm. I didn't care what language the music was in. I didn't care what style of dance it was. When we were in high school, we'd have like these heritage months. So February was African Heritage Month and, and like March or April or something like that was Asian Heritage Month. I didn't care. I'm like, I will be the first one to celebrate whatever culture it is through their dance, music, whatever. Like Asian Heritage Month, I was the first one to do Indian dances. 
in like whatever Indian song it was, even though at that time I didn't understand Hindi, I didn't know what the lyrics were saying, but I'm like, get me a lehenga, get me a sari. I'm doing those moves that I see in like those Bollywood movies. That's going to be me. Then we had a lot of Indian girls in my school. Like they could have been up and center on stage, but I didn't let that. Like, I'm like, that's me. Like move. This is me. Don't even come in my like <laughs> space. And then African Heritage Month would come and the African girls would be like, you're not African, you're not black, so you can't celebrate it. I'm like, no, but I am African. I'm North African. Morocco's in North Africa, so technically I'm black. <laughs> so it was the same thing as one episode in Rami where uh, he was telling his friends when they were kids, he's like, I'm technically black because Egypt is in Africa. Yeah. So I was like, oh my God, that happened to me too, you know? So identity crisis all over the place, but I always knew like where I belong, which was in the art world, the entertainment world. And how do you belong there when it's not even encouraged? You know, mm. like you go home and it's not encouraged. What are you doing? No, you can only be like a lawyer or a doctor. Or like, I could tell you one funny story. And like, obviously when I tell you these stories, my parents didn't know better. You know, like any other second generation immigrant family, they had a fear of two things. They feared that they were going to lose their culture because they live in a Western country and their kids are going to like, become Americanized or Canadianized. And that's like the most embarrassing thing. And they feared that their kid would not study. It's always about study, 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 study. They wouldn't study, they wouldn't graduate, and they wouldn't get their like masters or PhD or whatever. And they wouldn't make the family proud by being that doctor or being that like, I always say doctor, lawyer, teacher, because that's the only thing they kept saying. They never even said plumber. And yet they said plumber. I'd be like, you know, at least like, they I care love about this. it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they didn't care about anything else except these three things. So I used to like, like I remember once I was watching a film with my dad. Mm. I think I was like seven or eight. I don't even remember the age, but I was really young. And we were watching Jackie Chan films. And my dad used to be obsessed with Jackie Chan. So was I, because we used to own, that's how me and him used to bond when I was really young. And there was like a girl in that film and I, she was like interesting. She did the scene really nicely and it was so emotional. I said, oh, wow, I want to become an actress one day like her too. It just came out of my mouth, right? And my dad just turned around. He's like, don't ever say or think that again. And, you know, I was scared when he said that, you know, and he said it really like in that father tone, you know, I said, oh, okay. And Fed and like, really, I never said it ever again in front of anybody. Mm. I don't know. He scared the living lights out of me. How was the relationship with your uh, parents? My So with my dad, it was a very awkward relationship because when I was very, very young, I would say maybe five years old, six, seven, eight, he was there and we bonded through like watching films or something. But he would never ask me like, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you enjoy doing? It was never like that. It was always like, let's go to the candy store. We get candy. We come home. We watch TV. That's it. We didn't have open communication. And then, you know, the divorce between my mom and dad happened. So he disappeared. So we didn't really see him at all. So I think I lost out many years of being able to kind of bond with my dad or have a certain relationship with him due to the divorce. And I was with my mom constantly. So I think that must have had a certain effect mm. on me because... How old were you? So I was like 10, 10, yeah, 11. years. Yeah, it was. And I think that's a very sensitive age mentally. Mm. Like you're still developing and you're seeing certain things, you're hearing certain things and you're not understanding why they're happening. And kids do blame themselves. I was just going to say, yes, especially yes. at that age, because they're aware. They're not a three-year-old that doesn't mm. get it. No, no, they're aware. Yeah. And I think I had, like my brother is younger than me, he's four years younger than me. And I felt bad for him. Like I didn't feel bad for myself because I had like, I was looking at him like, oh man, like, I'm feeling bad, but like imagine how he's feeling. He's so young. He's like seven mm. at that time. So I think, which goes back to me being an emotional person. Like I think of other people's emotions and I feel other people's emotions and I'm, I empathize with them. So I would look at him and be like, oh, he's just so young. Like, what is he feeling? He didn't care. He's playing like PlayStation. He's playing like his video games. 
that age, I don't think he understood what was happening. He's like, oh. And some people also translate emotions differently. Yes, I think so. Maybe not like you. Like Sah, we we, we so... expect people to express like we do. They don't always. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Some of them become more introverted. Some of them become... And he did. He became introverted. Yeah. yeah. And I was thinking he maybe didn't care. But actually, maybe I didn't understand the introvert emotion mm -hmm. until off late, like recently. So I think I went through like a lot of... I was really angry at him, like my dad, for like not being there because I feel like there was a moment where I blamed like m myself as a child and then I grew up let's say age like 16 17 18 and then I just threw the blame on them and I'm like no like why you know what I mean why did you guys have to do that and then you know you see like families who are together and happy and you're like well, well how come I don't have that you know but now as an adult i understand things i understand relationships don't work out i understand people have to find their selves and they mm. have to find their future and now i understand these things very well and i don't blame them at all for the divorce it was necessary khalas like it had to happen but when you're a child you don't understand these things correct you just like understand whatever you're feeling in the moment and you just you're selfish that's it and i was very selfish i'm like we're, oh, we're not aware enough we're not aware we're not aware today i understand everything you know what i mean and and i think i'm so excited to have a family because i want to like make up for all the things we didn't have or experience mm. i want to do that with my kids and i want to do that with my family yeah. so maybe it was good that i had to go through that you know maybe like I'll be able to enjoy whatever family I will have in the future, inshallah, much better. And I won't take advantage of it. I won't take it for granted. But what happened like when they divorced and whatever I went through in my teens and then in my early adulthood had to happen to develop me as whatever hustler you want to call me or someone who can take up a challenge and make her dreams come true it really molded my personality. And if that didn't happen, I would probably be sitting somewhere in Canada, chilling, going out with my friends, having the good life, whatever. Yeah, okay, cool, not being really ambitious. But something had happened in the time between my parents getting a divorce, my dad not being around, my mom getting married again, me moving to Saudi. I moved to Saudi for three years in a really like fucked up time. Like I moved to Saudi when I was 13, 14, 15. Like no teenager Man, wants to go to Saudi at that time. So many different ecosystems. Yeah, ecosystems, environments, Cultures. circumstances, and just hitting me left, right, and center. And I'm a sponge. So I'm just sucking everything. Wow. And being 13, 14, 15, like Saudi is a great place, don't get me wrong. But when you're 13, 14, 15, you don't want to leave your high school. You don't want to leave your friends. You don't want to leave where you are comfortable. Mm -hmm. And you definitely don't want to learn another language. That's for sure, you know, and be going to Saudi and it's a different environment and it's a different mentality at that time. We're talking about like, we're talking about 15 years ago, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, you know, and, you know, new family and blended family and so many kids and, you know, different culture and like nobody understands Moroccan because that's the only Arabic I knew was Derija, you know, and that too, like 50 percent or like 40 percent. And whenever I would try to speak that, they'd be like, oh, we don't understand. Like, and I'm not Derija. And I'm just like, really? Like, do I, what do I have to do now? I have to learn their language. So like I started learning Arabic because everybody was like Lebanese, Jordanian or Palestinian or Syrian or Saudi. So I'm like, well, I need people to understand me. So I started learning. And whatever I learned, I made friends, I got along with people, whatever. And I absorbed that Arabic culture. I absorbed the Arabic music that I probably wasn't listening to much when I was in Canada. Mm. And I was like absorbing the arts, you know. I remember there was a show called Hizdiya Nawa'im. It was on NBC something, I don't know, NBC three or two or four or one, I don't, NBC one, I think. Mm. And it was all belly dancers that used to come and they were competing. There was like a jury and a judge. And I remember I used to watch that and I'm like, oh my God, this is so amazing. The only time I saw like belly dance when I was, before going to Saudi was like Shakira, 
you know, I didn't really see it properly. Mm. And then I saw this and I was like, oh, so beautiful. Oh my God, like, look how professionally they're dancing. And there was a jury and they would like, you know, critique them on their technique and stuff. I was like, wow, this is beautiful, you know. And there's just so much that I learned living in Saudi and being in that environment. And also like learning about different cultures and just how people are different in their mentality and how to like lise with people and I went back to Canada when I was 16 and um, because I just couldn't live in Saudi after a certain point. I'm so like, your, I can't your, do this anymore. Your mother stayed in Saudi? She stayed back, yeah, because she and had like, back. I had to move back. and Alone? With my brother. Okay. Yeah, we both moved back and reconnected with my dad. And I thought, let's, let's just try something now. I reconnected with my dad and stuff and went back to high school. And I created a new life for me in high school. Like, I wanted to be the most popular girl in high school. And you know, sh I should be popular and then I should have like my little clique of friends and we should be like the most popular girls in school. And the then, mean girls? A little bit, a little <laughs> bit. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I got bullied when I was younger. Like when I was in middle school, I was bullied by all the girls before going to Saudi. It was such a tough time for me. Like so, bad bullying? Yeah, like... really bad. Oh, really? Tyrion. Oh my God. How? So much. I, it, oh gosh, it's so, so funny. I was a little skinny, scrawny girl. Who wanted to like dance too because like in middle school all the girls danced and when we were 11 or 12 the girls started developing you know like they were having bodies and stuff and i was still this little like wall you know <laughs> so they used to make fun of me because i was skinny and i was trying to like do like certain dance movements like them and they'd be like ew like what is she doing and they would just push me into a locker or like i remember one day they did like a little troop a dance troupe and I used to watch them from a door in the cafeteria and they would be dancing and I'd just like come like hey guys can I join you and they just look at each other and start laughing like really mean things and then they're like can you like f off from here thank you and I'm like oh my god and then I would leave and then I would go home and stand in front of a mirror and turn on like Beyonce and Shakira and like all these people and start like learning moves in front of the mirror and I just do it again and again and again and then I would think I'm killing it and I probably wasn't because when I would go back to school, they make fun of you. They make fun of me. Like at one one school dance we had, the school got a DJ, and we did a school dance in the gymnasium, and all the girls were like in a circle dancing, and they could dance like naturally. They were just such good dancers, and they had swag and everything. And I was hungry for that. So you were never a natural dancer. I mean, I th I always thought I was. Oh, okay. But maybe they just like were bullies. Like, did you, period. Are you the type that was born with it, or you think you naturally trained to become that? I think I was always born with rhythm, and with being able to pick up moves. And then honing that skill. And then I just, as I grew up, I just increased the technique, increased, mm -hmm. increased. Technique means in front of the mirror, whatever I could see on YouTube. Yeah. And I, for some reason, I never understood why I had so much confidence in myself. I didn't understand. I would go to the school dance. And I would try to like come in the circle with them and everyone's hyping everybody, you know, like a cypher. And I'd wait for that churn for me to jump in. And then I'd jump in and do like that one move I learned from Shakira, like that one hip move. And they'd be like, what are you doing? Boo, all <laughs> oh, that wow. shit. So <laughs> but you keep doing it. I kept doing like a, like a crazy Well, I respect person. that. I swear. And then like, I remember like, I would be like, I'd grab a friend, I'm like, just dance with me. I feel really intimidated because they're laughing at me in the front of like, oh, okay. And then we start dancing and they'd just be there laughing, making fun of me. But well, Wallah Anas, I didn't care because the next time there was a school function, I'm on stage dancing nice. solo. They didn't understand Arabic dance. They didn't understand belly dance. I still dance. I remember the once I danced to Amar Dayab song on stage, I was like 12. And I wore this like white salwar kameez, which is like an Indian outfit. Mm. And I put like the scarf on my hip. And I came in running shoes and I'm like, play my song. And there was like 2,000 or 3,000 students. And I just started dancing to like, Amar Dayab song, that song, Wala Ala Bal. I know his song, but I don't yeah, know Yeah, it's the a name. very old song. Yeah. And I liked it because it had this like, dun, 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 this beat. I said, oh, this is so hip. And I mixed it with Britney Spears' Toxic. And I went <laughs> full on. And everybody's like, okay. I think they started respecting me after that. Maybe. Shway, yeah, a little bit. And then like after that, I would just, and I, I you know, and it's so funny because I knew my mom knew that I really liked doing that because she'd come to school and see me perform. Mm. And she's like, you did good. But you're going to be like a doctor, right? When you grow up, none of this stuff. This is just for fun. Yeah, for sure. And I'm like, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. And then run in my room, lock myself and, 
you know, start looking for people. And Beyonce's song "Crazy in Love" came out, and she did that move. Uh, 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 and yeah. I was like, oh yeah, I'm <laughs> learning this move, and I'm going to school, and I'm gonna do this move. And I remember I learned it, learned it, and standing in front of the mirror, I'm just, uh oh, uh oh, uh, oh shit, it's coming. I remember once I went to school, and I went to this guy. I said, like, you always make fun of me because you think I don't know how to dance. Watch my move. And I did it in front of her, and they started laughing at me, <laughs> and they pushed me, and I literally fell. It's like the movies. How you see it's they bully? It's very much like, like movies. Like that. Oh, tear, and it was so like. I don't know why I didn't stop. Like it should have made the, the me. The drive, your drive and hunger was higher than feeling embarrassed. Isn't that crazy? I think so because it's like let's say it's like a video game, and your life bar for hunger is way higher than oh shit I got embarrassed. If it was like this, first time you get embarrassed, second you're like fuck this, I don't want this feeling. I don't like it. But because your hunger was always higher. And the drive, mm-hmm. you didn't give a shit. I wouldn't say you didn't give a shit. It would bother you maybe a bump. Yeah, I cried but you come a back. lot. You come uh, back. Iktir, yani, a lot of times I cried because they were very, they were intimidating girls. You yeah, know what I'm I mean? Sure. And so, you're young. You know, I was very young. And that's the time where, you know, your psyche gets really, you know, affected. And it develops your personality, whether you're going to become an introvert so. or you're going to become a bully yourself or, you know. So when I did eventually go to Saudi, came back from Saudi, and now I'm in high school. I'm like, I'm flipping the script on everybody. <laughs> you know, everybody's going to get it from me. So I just wanted to conquer everything. I wanted to conquer my studies. Yeah. I wanted to be all the teachers' friends. I wanted to be the teacher's pet. I wanted all the cool girls to be my friends. And that's eventually what I did. Mm. And it's really funny because we used to wear school, like high school uniforms in school. Yeah. I'd be the only one who would come in jeans and heels. Like, you know Nora's coming down the hallway. Because the heels go back, 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 back. And I'd have this cardigan tied up, hair long. And I'd always do this like eyeliner and this really fucked up eyeshadow. I don't know. I, was, I thought it was a shit. And the teachers used to say nothing to me. They accepted it. Yeah, they're like, like it's okay. It's Nora. And all the girls and the guys are like, it's Nora, it's cool, whatever. I just felt so entitled, you know. And I think I gave myself entitlement, ambition, and self-confidence and i don't know where that comes from it's not like i come from a family where they always uplifted that's, that's me that's what i was thinking um two things one you didn't tell me how your relationship with your mother is mm-hmm. you just told me your father yeah and my mom so i love my mom so much and my relationship with her is great right now but we had like a rough patch and it's very normal because first of all when you're growing up in your teens everyone's relationship with their parents is always rough in their teenage years because we're trying to rebel we're trying to do so many things we're trying to find ourselves and they're getting scared they're trying to like just bring you down and 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 box you up because they don't know whether you're going to like go astray or you're going to go and and do things that you're not supposed to do you're going to come home pregnant you know what i mean you just never know so uh, there was a clash between me and my mom a lot because i was so hungry to find myself and hungry to do so many things like i said i'm so hyper and she was fearing a lot of things and Mm. and when you live in a western country as an immigrant the fear multiplies yeah like i would go to morocco sometimes and i see the girls living their life and their moms are cool and everything. And I didn't understand why immigrant parents were the total opposite. And it's just fear of losing the morals and the values and and the upbringing. So I found my mom, me and my mom clashing a lot. And I think the divorce also affected me in her relationship too, because um, I'm, I'm, I was a very jealous child. Like I was so jealous. When she got married, I was so jealous, I was so angry. <laughs> You know, you're smiling. Why are you smiling? Because <laughs> I like how animated you are. But it's like, true. I can <laughs> see the intensity. I was. Yeah. And I just, like, why? Why do you have me? You know, well, you have my brother. Why do you need someone? Yeah. Now I understand why, of course, as yeah. a woman. But that time I was so jealous. Yeah, because it's so about, spiteful. like you said, it's about us at that age. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I don't want to share my parent. Or... Never. I didn't want to you share. You know, funnily, I met somebody who probably was in their 30s or 40s. And she goes, can you believe my mother wants to get married now after being single for so many years? Me and my brothers are against that. And I'm like, you're fucking selfish. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, do you love your mom? She goes, yeah. I'm like, do you want her to be happy? Yeah. So why are you blocking her from love? Just so she stays the way you want her to stay. Yeah. And she's like, ah. And I'm like, exactly. 
do you want your if you truly love someone, Nora, whether it's an ex-boyfriend yes, or an anybody, ex-husband or a friend, ex-friend, anybody, yeah. It, love is not selfish; it's selfless. Mm-hmm. When you see somebody who breaks up with somebody, he's like, "I hope they have a shitty relationship." That's not love. Of course, this is That's spite, ha- it's hate. vengeance, hate. Oh, oh, but I didn't understand true that love at that age. Yeah, you're like, you know what? I'll step on myself and mm-hmm. my ego. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just hope they're happy. That's it. You have to just hope for someone to be happy. Yeah. But I didn't understand that. Yeah. I didn't. I was yeah. 13, 12, yeah, you whatever. Can't. You know. Fine. And I was like, no, this is just ruining my whole plan. <laughs> you know, that's all I kept thinking. And, and at the same time, you know, two families coming together, like yeah. blended families. That's let me tricky. tell you, that is the most complicated thing yeah. that could happen for anybody. There's a lot of compromising that needs to be done. And if everybody doesn't compromise, good luck. Mm. You know, it includes the kids. It includes the husband, the so. wife. And... I think the, the the situation or the experience of me seeing two blended families come together has made me more mature as a person. Eventually, I look back, I think of a lot of things. I understand life much better now. Um, I understand that even tomorrow, if I get married, I find someone. I have to understand the value of compromisation and being selfless if I want to have a good future with my family mm. and all that. That time I didn't understand I'm, I'm anything. Not a, I'm not a huge fan of the word compromise, although I, I agree with you. Compromise, my, think, let's say there's sacrifice. There's also, there, if you compromise to yourself too much, you're not Nora anymore. Moderation. Everything yeah. in moderation. You don't have to compromise yourself. It can compromise your 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 wants. Yeah, or your lifestyle. Adjust it a bit to cater for somebody yeah, new. Yeah, maybe I, I, I love to be alone. I like my alone time and I... But if I want a family and I want to marry somebody, then I might have to sacrifice that alone time that I love. Oh, 24-7, I'm alone. I want to have my yeah, yeah. this space of self-reflection. That's not going to happen. You know what I mean? <laughs> the, the second point. It's very interesting that in your story, you didn't have um, the injection of confidence from your parents to become a confident yes, person. Yes, but you I still, you, you became your own fan? I or became you, uh, oh. my, my own fan. Oh. Actually, yeah. It's tricky because, like, I didn't if, did you have, have a best anything. friend that would always spur Not you on? Not at that time. No. So how would you do that? So how would somebody that their parents... There was always outsiders that had confidence in me. Uh. I'll give you an example. When I was 11 or 12, I was in grade 6, I think. And that time, like I told you, I was always trying to dance and I was getting bullied and all that. There was one teacher that was always seeing this happening. And she went without telling me to we have an art school in toronto like the biggest art school and only like people with money go there posh students Mm. are there they get to learn everything they get to learn singing they get to learn drama theater instruments the violin whatever it is gymnastics that's like the overall package that's a dream come true for someone like me Mm. and she went and she spoke to that school and because of Anyways, the, 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 the school we went to, everybody was from low-income families. We were in the ghetto. We lived in the hood. Everybody knew that. So she knew if I wanted to go to a school like that, my family wouldn't be able to afford it regardless. So she spoke to the school and she showed them some, some stuff, some whatever. She told them about me. And she literally got a scholarship for me for that school. Nice. So all I had to do is take that paper to my mom and all she had to do was sign it. And the next year, I was going to start with them until I'm 18. Wow. And Khayil, one, two, three, four, five, six, this would be like six, seven years of that much of education that could have made me a more stronger performer today, a more stronger artist today. And I went to mm. her, and I will never forget this. And I don't think I've ever said this to anybody in any interview. I went to her, I said, Mama, it's this, 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 this. All you need to do is sign it. And I will be in a prestige art school. She said, no way. No. We don't do this. We don't have this stuff. You will study math, science, and all these subjects. And don't ever show me this garbage again. And I was begging her. Beg- I-, I remember for four days, I would come downstairs from my room. I'd be upstairs just working on what am I going to say to her? What's my speech to convince her? I will convince her. And I'd come down. No, 
I'd kiss her feet, beg her, please, mom, please, no, no. Don't come and ask me again. You come next time, I'll rip it in your face. And I went back to my, that teacher. I don't remember her name. I said to her, my mom said no. You know, she had tears in her eyes. She was so hurt. She's like, why? I said, and then she's like, I'll talk to her. My mom's like, no, we don't do this. She's like, no, but she has potential. So I think me seeing that and hearing that other people are saying I have potential and they see something, it means something. It has to mean something. Otherwise, like, why would someone even care? I'm not their daughter, you know? Mom's like, I don't even want to hear about this. So that's it. It's gone. And I took it as a challenge. It's okay. I don't need to go to a prestige school and learn. I will teach myself. Whatever I find, some open door, some free, uh, you know, one day a free trial workshop or some free activity in school, after school or something, I will do everything. I will learn everything and I will figure it out. Something will help me figure it out and I will become what I want to become. But that day taught me something that my, my dream of me wanting to become like this big star performer and entertain people, I'm not going to tell anybody this. I won't tell her, I won't tell my dad, I won't tell my friends, nothing. Block. Block. Khalas, block, of course. It's traumatizing. Yeah, I was going to say, how, how hurt were you? I was so hurt because, you know, I, I saw it there, like the opportunity was there. It's there, like I, I just, let me prove myself. Can I tell you something? Um, and I said this... It's something I just uh, imagined in my head and it made sense. And I've been saying it to people who I feel they, they need to hear it. Um, I feel, and this applies to you big time. Okay. All our journey um, and our story and our hurt and our pain and our joy and our experiences and our education and the bullying, everything you've been through creates a toxic petrol. Like petrol for the car. Right, yeah. Okay. The toxic petrol is created because of all of these experiences, because a lot of challenges and all of that. Mm. And it's in you. Mm. So either you burn the fucking fuel in the right direction or you get poisoned with it. Mm -hmm. And you getting rejected in taking a huge opportunity with the prestigious school, the divorce Something we need to talk about is when you worked in McDonald's, when you worked in, yeah. in the shawarma place <laughs> and the lottery tickets. And we need to talk about that. All of these experiences, the multiple cultures, the getting pushed on lockers, everything created a Nora fuel. Some people, and I'd say most people, they have this fuel and it consumes them. Yeah, it's very toxic. But the ones who burn it, you know why they become great? It's because it's such a unique fuel. Only you have that fuel. I don't have your fuel. I don't have your experience. I don't have your story. Mm -hmm. So I can't compete with you in the same way. If you burn it, it's different flame than mine. Oh. And that's why I think you're crazy. Like you're so driven. Mm -hmm. you're, you will not take no for an answer. That's not normal. Most it's people after normal. three no's, it's a, maximum. I get problems because of this. Yeah, because someone I will relate. say no. And I'm like, no, but why? Wait, yeah. why? Wait, hold on. The person's like, I don't have time. I've got another meeting. No, no, fuck that meeting. Tell me why. Just make me understand. Just make me understand. And for some people, mostly yeah. men, because I have to interact with mostly men in my industry, it can be like, hey, man, she's a little crazy. Like, don't challenge me. It's an ego issue also. And I'm like, no, I just need an answer. You tell me why. Like, for example, why you don't want me in this movie? Why you don't want me? Why? Tell me why. Yeah, and it makes sense. Like, who are you for me to explain why? That becomes an ego issue. Like, I, I don't even think of all that. I just need to know why. Why, why, why? And it's because of all of these things we said. The, the point I mentioned about you working these uh, many jobs, you, you did them at 16 years old, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, High yes. school. Yeah, yeah. So you were taking care of your brother, I believe? Yes. I why? Was. Why were you in this situation? So it was a certain circumstance, a circumstance that I was, it was not in my control. We came back from Saudi to live with my dad and we did live with him for about a year and it just didn't work out. And um, something that, you know, he just didn't want. 
And uh, the only solution at that time was for me to be just with me and my brother. And that time my brother was 13. So I said, okay, well, I guess I got to take this responsibility. And I think as a girl slash becoming a woman, whatever you want to call it, we have the ability to just put ourselves aside and look at the situation and decide, what am I going to do with this situation? And we, are, we know how to take responsibility very well. So I'm looking at this kid who's 13 and I'm like, okay, <laughs> like this is, I got to make the best out of this circumstance. And I have this thing about me, which is from my childhood. I don't know if it's good. I don't know if it's bad. I constantly need to prove you wrong. I need to constantly, next year when you see me, you're going to see me much better. And you should say, oh, man, I really didn't understand this girl. Or I should have given her a chance. Or, I should have believed in her. I have this complex. It's very weird. I have it with everybody. With a family member, with a friend, with an ex, with a coworker. I always have this ego issue that you took advantage of me. You didn't believe in me. And you thought I was shit or you thought I was nothing. Now you see what I'm going to do. Maybe that's helped me grow. It adds to the fuel. But it's toxic. It is. It is because I'm always like, you know what hugra is, right? I always feel like, you know, someone has done me wrong. And yeah, there are a lot of people who did. Did you watch um, The Last Dance? I did, yeah. It's only yeah. how Michael Jordan imagines that somebody says something bad to him and then that spurs him on to, yeah, but to, to beat them. Th- it's a great way of pushing yourself, but it's also toxic because yeah. sometimes maybe it's not the case. But no. I'm thinking like that. Yeah, yeah. And it, why the person said no? What's wrong? Does he not think I'm capable? Does he think I'm not talented enough? It's, it's fucked up. But you know what I mean? But it it's from a younger age, you know? So. so when I found myself, it's just me and my brother. I was like, well... I can't have anyone think that we as kids in Canada are going to go the wrong way, Mm. that he's going to end up being with a gang because I lived in Jane and Finch. Anybody Googles Jane and Finch, it's the hood out of all the hoods in Canada. It's the most aggressive, rough area. All the guys ended up dealing with weed or being involved in a gang or killed. All the girls ended up being pregnant or with like a gang member or it was rough, you know what I mean? Like, thankfully, my friend circle, alhamdulillah, like they were all in, we were all tight and good. So everybody ended up having a good future and everybody had a good head on their shoulder. But most of them didn't. Mm. And I knew when people found out that me and my brother are alone now, they're all going to talk. They're all going to say, oh, she's going to do this. She's going to do that. The kid is going to end up like this. I didn't want that. So I told my brother, I said, you're going to focus on school. And I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make sure that we have a roof under over our head, we have food, and we are well taken care of. And, you know, we ended, we were living like in a one room, just me and him, for like a few months. And then I was like, we're not staying here. We got to, like, we need to elevate. We need to, like, level up. So from that, obviously, I was working at McDonald's and I was working at a telemarketing place, which was really funny because I was, I used to harass people. Like, my job was cold calling. I would call someone and sell lottery tickets to them. And I felt bad for them because they were all old people. (laughs) And I'd be like, hi, sir, what are you doing today? And then he'd be like, "Uh, who is this? I'm like, listen, I got an opportunity for you. You cannot miss this. Today, we're selling these lottery tickets for, you know, like, and a lot of people used to hang up on my face. And I used to get so pissed because I'm working on commission here you know I need to sell lottery tickets and whatever like I did whatever I needed to do and that obviously elevated my communication skills because and now I see I look back I'm like wow like it helped me a lot no for an answer I never took a no for an answer and then wait sir don't hang up wait and he's like you know what you sound sweet I'm gonna give you five minutes of my time and I'm like all right you're never gonna forget this blah 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 I don't believe in gambling. I also don't believe in lottery tickets, but I had to do what I had to do. It's the hustle, you yeah. know? And I'd be like, haram, you know? <laughs> I felt so bad. But then, yeah, I do my shift there. And then I used to, like, before that, I was working at a men's clothing store. Mm-hmm. I was like a uh, sales associate. And I was only like 16 at that time. And it used to be next to my high school. So I'd finish school, like run to the mall, get dressed, do my shift, and then go back home. And that was interesting because... 
I used to see men come like really like insecure about themselves. They didn't really have confidence. They'd be like, hi, I'm looking for a suit. I'm like, I have the best suit for you. Come with me. And then, you know, just put their suit on like that. I'm like, look at you. You look amazing. Like, you wow. should buy three. <laughs> yeah, <I'd> buy three, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, okay, bye. So that was like an experience in itself. But after I left high school and I, and I went to uni, because I got all the scholarships in the world, like when I graduated Anas from Westview Centennial Secondary School, nobody's going to forget Noor Fateh in that school because I wiped out all the scholarships. Really? I graduated with a 97.8% average. Wow. And mashallah, like all the teachers were so proud of me. Like till today, I have relationships with my teachers. Like I have a teacher named Mr. Jones and he was my business um, uh, subject teacher and we still chat like all the time and whenever I go to Canada I meet him he's like you're my favorite student I was like I know you know what I, mean? I took all the scholars and I went to York University and I was like in the yearbook you know that in the end of the year like when mm -hmm. we graduate we write what we want to be yeah so they gave me the yearbook they're like you got to write under your picture what you want to be and if there's anybody in the world who finds that yearbook just let me know tag me on Instagram I don't have it anymore I wrote I was gonna write I want to I want to create history. I want to break records. I want to be the first to do something. I don't know what it's going to be, but it has to be, no, I thought he was the first to do it. Mm. And then I remembered that thing that I told myself, I'm not never going to tell somebody what I actually want to do. So I wrote lawyer. Interesting. Yeah. I'm never going to forget that because I went, no, nobody's going to know until I do it. I like it. Yeah. How did you jump all the way to move to India? So when I, when I went to uni for a year, I couldn't keep up. I couldn't do all those jobs and waitress and serve shisha and tea and sell lottery tickets and go to McDonald's and fight with people at drive throughs and go to uni at the same time. I just couldn't do it. And I felt ashamed of myself because I went from 97.8% or 97.6% whatever percent average to suddenly I'm failing. That's not Nora. Mm -hmm. No, it's shame. I was so upset at myself and I'm like, I have two things to do. Either I stop this and I actually look for what I really want to do. And I knew what I wanted to do since I was a child. And I grow balls and do it. Or I continue pretending that this is what I want to do just to show, look, I got 95%. Look, I got 90%. It was all a number game for me. Mm. I didn't care about anything. I just wanted to show off that I had the top grade in my class. And how did I know that that was the issue that I had? Because when I eventually did uni and I was failing, all I would th think about is, look, this is shameful. I'm getting 70%. This is shameful. I'm getting 65%. I wasn't thinking, no, I'm not learning what I want to learn. I'm not grasping the information. I'm not understanding the lecture. I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about the numbers. So I realized this is wrong. So let's stop this. And let's do what you really want to do. Hmm. And unfortunately, maybe, maybe if I wasn't doing, if I didn't have my brother as my responsibility and myself as a responsibility, and I didn't have all these extra jobs, maybe I would still be in York University, you know, killing it hmm. with the numbers. But eventually when I would graduate five years later, I would become what, 28, 25, 26 and realize this is not what I want to do. Hmm. I was just doing it to show off for numbers which is wrong. You can never take back those years you wasted, huh. right? So I think God did that on purpose. He put me in that situation of struggle and, and whatever circumstance, he just took everyone away from me. He did it on purpose because if that was the only way I would have found my calling and, and grew confidence and guts to just do it because my mom wasn't there. She was in Saudi, right? My dad wasn't there. So there was nobody for me to say, guys, I'm leaving university. I don't want to do this anymore. And I'm going to become an entertainer. I'm going to find my calling. There was nobody to say that to. If they were there, maybe I would be too scared. So, I would be too scared to say it's anything. It's everything. It's the whole environment and circumstances of your life that facilitated such yeah, a decision. Yeah, and I'm a big believer, Anas, of destiny, mm. of nasib. I am. Yeah. I know God does certain things mysteriously and in that moment you don't know why he did it you're like why why me why am i being tested why am i being put into like uh these situations of turbulence and stuff 
But later you understand that this happens for a reason. Mm. It's to divert you to where you belong, where you are meant to go. And at that time... So your brother, where did he come with you or no? No. So here's what happened. So my brother is finishing school. So it's about a couple of years of me doing this hustling, hustling, hustling. And Salaha, I was really tired. I'm sure. Tebet. And I looked at him and I looked at myself and I said to my girls, I had a lot of my girls from high school. They're still always there for me, you know. And he's a bigger boy then. Yeah, he's bigger now. Now uh, he's like, like eight, 17, chance, 18. No, when you wanted to leave, I think by that time he's a bit more. Yeah, hard. he's 17, 18. Yeah. You know, I looked at him and I said, listen, like, I said to myself, I cannot lose my ears. I cannot. Mm. And yes, I love my brother. I understood my responsibility. But it would be so wrong if someone like me who had so much potential, we're not repeating the same thing that happened when I was 11, 12. Uh. I'm not doing that again. Mm. This is another chance for me that I, I'm independent now. I don't really have a lot of restrictions for me to just run. Run and just look for myself and my future. That's all I kept thinking. And my friend said, you know, you're right. Maybe you should just do it. And it was an overnight thing where I woke up and I left all those jobs and I started searching for avenues. I would Google Toronto's best agency. And whatever agency that came, like modeling acting agency that came up in the, in the first page, yeah. I called them. Hey, hi. And to see the confidence and the stupidity on my part. Hey guys, I'm just like, you know, my name's Nora and I just wanna be like a really big actress and a big star. So I just wanted to know like, how can you help me? And that owner of the agency was a Pakistani guy named Tipu. So he was just like, I like your energy. Why don't you come to the office, you know? And I'm like, yeah, all right. So I had an appointment with him like four days later. And while I'm driving in the car one of these days, I hear something in the radio. And it was like, do you want to become a star? Do you want to become an actor? Do you think you are there meant for showbiz? And I'm like, yeah. This is for me. And I just put the volume up and I'm driving and I'm listening to him. Like, yeah, yeah. And then he's like, you need to come to our workshop at da, 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 whatever at this hotel at this daytime. I said, this is Nasib. This is Dustin. This guy's talking for me, <laughs> you know? So I went to that place and I joined that workshop and they selected like five people to go to the next level workshop. And the next level workshop is in Philadelphia. So you have to travel on your expense. You have to book your own hotel mm. and you need to go to that workshop where you like do a monologue in front of these agencies and you show them your portfolio and you do this modeling walk. I said, yeah, piece of cake. I'm going to do all this. Three days before that, my appendix almost ruptures. So I get operated on. And I've got like the flight in the next like two, three days. And the doctor's like, no, you can't go. I went. I didn't care. I could hardly walk. And I still went because I'm like, I'm not missing this opportunity. I was wheelchairing my ass to Philadelphia to go and meet these people because I'm like, they need to see me. I don't care. I had shitty pictures because I wasn't a model at that time. But I prepared my monologue so well and it was a comedy monologue. I'm like, I'm going to make them laugh. They're going to love me. And I did it. And I met these agents and they're like, you're really good. Why don't you come to America? We'll do your visa. And suddenly I didn't want to go. I don't know what happened. I lost interest. I wasn't inspired. And for me, I need to be inspired. I said, yeah, all right, cool. I thought I was like, I just did all that and came all the way here with an almost ruptured appendix. I was operating, I couldn't walk. And I sat in front of these people and suddenly I wasn't excited anymore. Mm -hmm. Something is wrong. Huh. Something is wrong. I took my flight back to Toronto. I land, that agency calls me, that Tipu guy calls me. He's like, I have something for you, come. I said, all right. I go and meet him. He's like, do you want to go to India? Mm. I said, yeah, fuck yeah, I want to go to India. Let's do this. He's like, you want to think about it? I said, what's there to think about? India, Bollywood, Shah Rukh Khan, period. He's like, yeah, okay, but just think about it. I was like, no, we grew up watching Hindi cinema. We grew up watching Bollywood films. I'm obsessed with this one film called Devdas. Okay, I watched it like 20 million times growing up. And why? Because it has dance, music, art. It was so like theoretical, it was so big, it was so dreamy. And that for me was so exciting. I said, Tipu, this is what I'm looking for, man. I'm looking, this is inspiring. I'm looking for somewhere where I can do all of it. I can act, dance, 
be emotional, be dramatic, look beautiful, everything. This mm. is that's what Bollywood is. Like I've been looking for it, and you've just given me the answer. He's like, "All right, when do you want to go?" I'm like, "Now, let's do this now." And he's like, "All right." After a week, I'm taking my flight to India, but I was so overexcited that I didn't think about what is required to go to India. Visa. Visas, fuck the visa, the actual requirement, language, network, contacts. Everything. Mm. I just went like a silly girl, and I'm telling my girls, the day I signed that contract, I called my girls. I'm like, girls, you guys gonna have to come over. I have news for you. And all my friends, they're obsessed with Hindi cinema too, with Bollywood, because you know, mm. Somalian, Kenyan. We all watched, you know, so. Bollywood films growing up. So they all came to my house, and we're sitting. I'm like, guys, I'm going to Bollywood. <laughs> and they're like. Girl, you made it. We made it. This is it. We start from the bottom. Now we're here. You know, all of that was happening. And then the other ones like, "Tell Shah Rukh Khan I said hi." You know, so it was like that hilarious. We were so excited and so naive, yeah. so naive. Because when I reached India, it was nothing like that. <laughs> I was thinking that the, I was gonna get picked up by a limousine with like a butler, and they're gonna take me to this suite, and I was gonna live in a ni- nice life in a hotel, and I'm gonna go to my auditions via the limousine. It's gonna be nice. It's gonna be like high level lifestyle because I'm going to Bollywood. You know, it was nothing like that. I had the biggest shock of my life, the biggest slap in the face when I arrived. And the struggle I went through, the bullying, the rejection, the traumatic experience I went through. I, if I knew that before going to India, if someone told me, "This is all the things you're gonna go through. You're gonna meet evil people. They're gonna steal your passports. You're gonna get deported." You're gonna go back to Canada. People are gonna laugh at you and say, "Why did you go anyways? How do you leave a developed country to go to a developing country?" Then you're gonna go back to India, and you're gonna fight. You're gonna learn the language. You're gonna learn the language. You're gonna learn the language, and you're gonna meet people who are gonna laugh at you on the way. Whenever you try to speak, they're gonna laugh on your face. That happens to me all the time. You know how many times I would spend hours. And weeks and months and years with my Hindi diction coach and Hindi teacher to learn the language, and he would uplift me and he'd be so positive and say, "You are doing so good, Beta. You are speaking so well. I'm so proud of you." And he'd make me so confident. And I would go to a casting director or I'd go to an audition, and they would know I'm not Indian, and they would call me specifically and say, "The lines are in Hindi. Can you do it?" I say, "Yeah, I'll try my best." And I would do them, and they would laugh. In front of me, during the take, they would start laughing together, high-fiving each other. Ha 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 ha! Did you hear how funny she sounded? And I, my ego, I'd be like, "How fucking dare you? Wait till I leave, at least. You know what I mean? Like, why would you do it in front of my face?" And that would take me back to when I was eleven. I was just gonna say. Oh man. I get so angry, and I would have this dirty attitude, and I'd be like, "What's so funny? Nee, nee, nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> no, what's so funny? Because like you were like hilariously laughing, like a fucking hyena. What's so funny? No, 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 it was cute. And I would leave, and I that time I was traveling in a rickshaw. I didn't have a car. You know what rickshaws are, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'd stand in the middle of the road, and it's always raining. <laughs> So Paul, it's always <laughs> raining when shit happens, uh-huh. and it's raining, and I'm like hailing the rickshaw. He's coming, and I'm crying. And I'm like, you know, I was that time I was living in an area called Vira da Sai Road. So I'd be like, Maya, Vira da Sai Road, <laughs> and I'd be crying. He'd be like, huh? I'd be like, Vira da Sai Road, chilla. And he would take me, and I would go, and I'd howl and cry in the fucking rickshaw. And the rickshaw driver is like traumatized. He's driving, and he's like looking, and he doesn't know what to do. And I'm like. <laughs> Crying, and I pick up the phone. And I call my Hindi teacher. You said I was good. You said I was doing so good. And he'd be like, "What happened?" I'm like, "They laughed at me." That's all I would say. They laughed at me. They laughed at me, and I would cry. And it happened so many times to me. It was so difficult because all you wanted to do was learn, and be accepted, 
and you are learning and you are investing time and energy and you want to be so positive and you're getting the complete opposite back and it feels like the minute a door is opening it's closing in your face it's like they're opening it they're like hey like it's open come and you're rushing towards it and they go right in your face and that's what i went through for five years constantly if it wasn't the language it was the fact that i'm not indian and that would make me so angry because i'd be like no no but listen like I'm, I'm North African, I'm Arab. Like our cultures are very similar and I'd want to make them understand that we are so similar. Like it's, don't focus on our differences, focus on our similarities. And nobody cared, you know what I mean? They're like, no, you're a foreigner, you're not from here. Do you even understand what it means to be Indian? Rightly so, I understand where they're coming from. This happens in every country, in any industry you go to. But I was so driven and so hungry that I just couldn't understand. It what goes back to, again, when my mom, the divorce, everything, I was selfish, I didn't understand. Mm-hmm. And this is another scenario which is the same where I didn't understand where they were coming from. Today I understand where they're coming from because they want someone to earn it. You want to be here today, earn it. Learn our language, learn what it and is. And they need you to be relatable. Be relatable. To the you are You are going to connect to billions of people. If you're not relatable, why are we gonna invest our money? Mm. on you who mm. are you Sah. it's true but i couldn't i couldn't fathom that i didn't understand that because i believed in myself mm. just give me a chance just see my audition no we don't want to audition you i would stand in lineups for hours by the way nora if they gave you a chance in year one i would be over you would have failed i would be finished it, because you kept polishing 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 yourself and i was a sponge i was are, sucking you're a rough diamond but you're rough. Yeah. You have to keep training and, and just 100%. really. And, and by five years, you probably were very. But when you're hungry, very you ready. don't think I know. about that. I know. When you're driven, you don't think about yeah. that. I'm telling you, as Nora Fatih believes in destiny, she believes in Qadar. She believes when God wants something to happen, it will happen. She believes everything happens for a reason. That's the basics. But because of my overdrive and my hunger, I forget all that. I forget all that. Yeah. Why this didn't happen? Why this person is not giving me a chance? Why? 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 I, I, Yani, I am smart, hmm. but the overdrive and the hunger, it gives you that. It clouds it. Okay, that's emotional. It's emotional. That's why I told you in the beginning, I'm a very emotional person. Huh. You know. I have a question. Now that, uh, uh, fast forward those five years. And you, you were saying something, you would stand in line for hours. I, you didn't auditions that were sentence. the worst things. Yeah. I'm auditioning with 300, 400, 500 people who want the same thing. And imagine, I was co- auditioning with girls who are from Brazil, who also wanted to be Bollywood actresses, didn't know the language, didn't care for the language, but they said, whatever, let's try our luck. I was auditioning with Indian girls. I would uh, audition with other South Asian girls. I was auditioning with the world because suddenly Bollywood became a vocal point of where actors wanted to come. Mm. Something had happened in Bollywood where people globally were coming, trying their luck. I didn't think that, I thought I was only gonna compete with Indian girls, you know? I didn't think maybe, I thought maybe not a lot of Indian girls wanted to do it. Maybe I might compete with like 10, 15, hundreds. Hundreds. I got put in a house when I I landed in India. You lived with eight people, right? Can you imagine? Eight Eight, nine girls. Yeah, I read. Can you imagine? No, I don't want to imagine. Yani, this is the biggest shock of my life. Mm-hmm. When I entered this house, and not nice girls, rude girls who were cutthroat. Vicious. Vicious. Mm-hmm. And they were the ones who stole my passport. Hello. Like within the first few months. And that was the biggest embarrassment. I cannot go. I'm telling the, the embassy, the counselor, don't send me back, please. Inshallah, don't send me back. They're like, no, but you don't have a passport. You don't have a visa. It's protocol. We've got to send you back. You don't understand. Like before I came, everybody back home, like all the people that knew me, not my friends, but people who knew me, they're like, oh, she's going to India. That's so stupid. Mm. She thinks she's going to do something like, she's going to be back in 10 days. I can't go back. It's like, it's like a bet, you know? Sa, sa. You don't want to prove them right. They thought I was too, so crazy. They're like, move, like you need to go back. You're out, like sort your shit out. So let's fast forward. Five years in India. A new breakthrough. And today, Nora is one of the strongest Arabic personalities in the world. 
in terms of social media, in terms of engagement, in terms of following, in terms of popularity in your field. Hello, we can safely say that. Although you come from a background that doesn't completely support the arts, you're an, you have yes. an Arabic background. Yes, yes, yes. How does, is your family now accepting of all the success? Do the new numbers and popularity and fame and money and power, does it make your family feel, okay, now we get it, it's okay, we'll support her? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they came I about? So. I think um, they will around. always, they came around. Yeah, they came around. I think there will always be internal struggle within themselves because they have a certain upbringing and a certain mentality and it's very hard to break mm. that mm. it's very hard to break that but i think they have no choice they don't. they don't have a choice how yeah, like how that. how everywhere they go they hear about me everywhere they go they hear my songs or they see me on screen or someone is talking about me or they switch the channel it's me somewhere they have to look at it as an accomplishment. If the world is celebrating her, why can't we celebrate her? Khalas, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. And I think it's a certain, like we always say, they didn't know better. The yes. upbringing was different. The mentality you was different. You know, that's the same sentence my mother always uses, especially when she meets um, uh, people who are struggling. Okay. With, with, let's say their father wasn't loving or tough love or strict right. or whatever. And she always tells them, they didn't know better. So, it's true. Give them that. The benefit of the doubt. Uh, okay. Um, do you like fame? I do. Hmm. Yeah, I do. Do you want more of it? I do want more of it. I'll tell you why I want more of fame and why I like fame. Because it comes with a certain power and it comes with a certain platform and ability to do certain things that you can't do otherwise. The fact that I have such a big reach I know what I want to do with it. I want to convert it to something good. The kind of fame I have and the attention I have, being known, I don't just want to be known. Okay, khalas, yeah, she's famous. Great. One day there was a Nora Fethi. I don't want to end it like that. I want to convert it to something where I make a difference. And it goes back to, remember I told you, when I was looking at the world, and what was going on in the world, and I wanted to do this, 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 this. The thing. lawyer time. Then I thought, okay, to protect it's kids. too much, yeah. It's too much, too much, too much. Mm. But I know with my fame and my platform and opportunities, I can go back and do that. Mm. Because people will listen to me, and I will make an impact. Mm. And I'm going towards there slowly. I see, subhanAllah, I see the kind of audience that I pull is a lot of kids. It's a lot of youngsters. I have a mix of male, female, all different age groups. But majority, I'm seeing young, yeah. young, 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 young ones. And I want to inspire them. Because they're our future. They are our future. And if we want anything to change in our world, the situation we are going through, it's going to be via them. So. Every interview for me is more important than a movie coming out or a song coming out. Because I know this is how I can reach them, make them think, make them believe, make them even, like I said, positive, just a little bit, to either make their dreams come true or be positive to someone at a coffee shop when they're going to get their coffee or when they're going to school. Hmm. These things are so important because they are, create a domino effect yeah. to the bigger thing, the bigger picture. This is the, yeah, Nora, this is the show. The mm -hmm. show is not about Nora and not about Anas. Yeah, yeah. Fuck us. Yeah, yeah. It's about every person who needs to feel not alone. Yeah. It's about every person who thinks, I don't think anybody gets me. Oh, shit. Nora gets me now. Anas kind of said something that actually Which made me I feel a bit too. different. Yeah. That's the show. Yeah, definitely. Yes, it's important to know your personal story, mm -hmm. but the more important thing is how it can relate and connect to somebody outside watching. You know, it's so you funny. You remembered something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, something about Rami that I like mm. is representation. We don't have a lot of representation. No. And growing up, I wish I did. I wish I had that one girl that was like kind of like me, maybe like, 
She's got so many like different elements to her. She's, you know, doesn't know exactly what her identity really is. She's got so many mixtures into her. She's traveled so much. She's been everywhere so much. And she's done something so big. Mm -hmm. And I can look at her as a role model. And she's Muslim. I know you don't talk about religion, but it's important to mention that because sure. it's an identity thing, right? And she's Arab and she's proud and she says You're it. You're relatable. Yeah, I wanted that when I was growing up. I didn't have that. But that's what you're doing now. It seems like you're trying to be the person you needed when you were young. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of girls needed that. Yeah. A lot of girls. I have so many girls I know who are so lost today. They are so lost. And they say because we didn't have, we didn't have uh, someone to uplift us. Mm. That's the only word. I want to say guide. I want to see role model, but it's not even about guiding and being a role model. It's the uplifting. Yeah. I don't know what you are meant to be. You will find that out by yourself. You'll find out what your calling is by yourself. Your intuition will tell you. Things will guide you. But if you don't have someone to uplift you, where are you going to get the confidence to like huh. go and reach for it? I think that teacher of yours was a magic moment for you. Yeah, because definitely. Because it's the stranger that suddenly believes in you more than you believe in yourself. Like, what? If you believe in me that much, why don't I believe in me this much? Uh, yeah. Um, I think I needed that. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Have you been depressed? I don't want to play with the word depression like that. I know what depression really means. Mm. And I know people who've really gone through it. I don't think I've ever been clinically depressed, but I think I've really felt a little bit of a depression yeah. where I felt low, where I felt I don't have anybody. I felt like, when is it going to get better? It's always that question. Mm. When is it going to get better? And there was a point where I thought, this is too much. It's taking too long. I just want, I want to earn. I want to celebrate my talent. I want, I want validation. Mm. You know how, how crazy it is in the artistic world? We are so hungry for validation. We are so hungry for someone to celebrate our, our skill and our talent. We're so obsessed over that. And I didn't have that for so long. And I just wanted that. But I wanted that in a foreign country. And I wanted that in a place where I didn't belong. I didn't have any roots. Mm -hmm. And I wanted that. I made things more complicated for myself. We accept that by now. Pretty much. You're still you know? But I think it's because I knew that this is where I was meant to be. Mm -hmm. I knew there was a day I was sitting in my room, struggling to pay my rent in India had no money, okay? I was begging my agency for money. They didn't keep a shit about me. They just cared about the other girls. They were uplifting those other girls and they were like, just really fucking my shit up. Like they were making me suffer. And I didn't have money for rent. And I remember thinking, I was like, what do I want? What do I want to do? And what am I going to prove to everybody who has made it so difficult for you to just move one step forward, whether it is via finances, via food, rent, just living standards was so bad for me. I was losing a lot of weight. I was really unhappy and I was struggling. And I said to myself, I know what I want. I want to make history in Bollywood. And I went back to what I thought I wrote in my yearbook when I said I wanted to be the first to do mm -hmm. something. I want to be the first Arab African artist to make it in Bollywood. All those people that used to watch Bollywood movies and obsess over Shah Rukh Khan and Amitabh Bachchan and everything, they're gonna see themselves in here now. It's gonna be me. And then when I do that, I will break a stereotype. The stereotype that dancers can't do anything but dance. I will break that stereotype. I will make sure they respect dancers. Even though I'm not a professional dancer, I never learned dance. I never considered myself a professional dancer, but we're gonna do it. And then when I do that and I act in films and I dance and I, and I break a record, I don't know what record that's gonna be, but I'm gonna break a record. And then I'm gonna go to the Arab world and I'm gonna be celebrated there too. And I'm gonna bring the Arab world and the Indian world together and we're gonna become global. And it's gonna be Nora Fetahi who did it. And my kids are gonna be so proud. <laughs> That's what I thought. And I kind of, I'm there. Dilber bro broke a world record. It was the first song to ever do 20 plus million in less than 24 hours. That was me. Like, that was my first record. I broke another record after that. 
now everyone's saying I'm the first African Arab woman to solely hit a billion views on YouTube. Collectively, I have over 4 billion views on YouTube. But you'll never be satisfied. I'll never be satisfied. But I have a, I have a nice quote for you. I'm Tell putting me. it in my office in the house. Uh, always grateful, never satisfied. Never satisfied. Because I want more. But that's me. I want more. But I want to open we don't my... forget to be grateful. I think as long as you balance always it. Always I say alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. Always but say it's, alhamdulillah. But it's clear because you're at peace with your past. Definitely. But I'm not mm. done. I want to no. open my own academy. Nice. And I want it to be global. I want it in India. I want it in Dubai. I want it in Morocco. Why not? I want to uplift the kids. The kids, the kids. Uplift them, uplift them. You know what I keep happy. repeating, Nora? If, if, every, if every young person watching this, I will focus, like you said, on young people. Even old, actually. Sure. If everybody changes the word why to why not, mm. so many things will change in life. Uh, of course. Yes. Just put why not. Yeah. Why should I go there? Why not? Why should I open this business? Why not? Why, not? Uh, why should I do this? Why should huh? I go to this audition? Everybody else is better than me. Why not? Because if you do 10 of those, you'd probably very, be very good by number 10. 100%. You know? You know, they say something is only impossible because it's not been done yet. So, or uh, there's another one. The answer is always no if you don't try. So, hmm, okay. Definitely. We go to another point. Um, or do you find this interesting? I'm loving it. This conversation? Oh, absolutely. Because I've said things to you that I've not said in any other platform no, before. Thank you. Um, hmm. What does love mean to you? Love right now, ah, you know what? Initially, I had a very naive way of thinking of what love is. Love is one plus one is two. It's black and white. That's it. That's it. Then I became an adult and I now I'm I'm seeing stuff. I'm living life and I'm experiencing some things and I'm saying it's a shame that love is not what it used to be. Hmm. I don't know why. Maybe it's just things I'm seeing. Or maybe a lot of people are noticing this. But real love is very very limited very rare very rare i don't understand the concept of how real love can be limited when it's the most important beautiful thing do you understand mm. what i mean it doesn't make any sense to me when you, someone's ready to love you and you know you can't give that love back why would you stop why would you stop yourself mm. you know how many people i have met who are like no, no i don't want to fall in love i don't want to love why would you not want such a beautiful positive thing they're scared. Yeah, I understand that. But we have such a limitation of it today in our world. And this is why our world is in the shit that it's in. Why would you not want to experience that? The next generation, Noor, I think would be a bit different. We are tr starting to accept vulnerability. That's the word. Nobody wants to be vulnerable. No, although it's powerful. Nobody. But it's rare. You know how many actors I know who fear to be vulnerable and to be real? They don't want that. I learned that being real and being honest, you need to be a very comfortable person in your own skin and very courageous. To be honest, you need to be courageous awesome. because lying is a very cowardly act. Where were you today? Uh, I was at the doctor and you're lying. Instead of saying, I woke up late, sorry. No, I didn't know what I was doing. Myself. I really messed yeah. up the alarm, but it needs a bit of, Courage. It's and you'll true. notice people who are big liars are big cowards. They'll never tell you to your face. You know, I hope everybody in the world finds love without any strings attached. Have you been in love? I have. Yeah, okay. yeah, I have. Do you like the um, idea of marriage? I do. You do? Yes. I'm going to tell you something. As an actor, celebrity, public figure, whatever you want to call me, as a female, we have a fear of getting married or having kids. We feel that our career will be over or we should do this many things in this span of time and make it happen and then get married. Or don't get married at all if you want to enjoy a long span of success mm. in the field that we're in. Mm. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe if you truly want to be happy, 
your career, yes, and your personal life together. I know an actor who's not married, doesn't have kids. And I know an actor who's married, has kids and has a career also. I think he's more happier mm. because he has both the best of both worlds. It's so important to get married and have kids. It's so important to have kids. You have to you have to have that that light in your life. It's a different light. It's a different love. It's a different innocence also. Absolutely. You see the world in a different way. And I have a lot of love to give Anas, a lot of love, and I will give it through my kids and my husband while simultaneously doing what I love. A lot of great um, celebrities or great figures have gotten married, had kids, and their career has done even better. Yeah. You know, have, they've flourished. Why not? Why not? What is this mentality that if you get married and have kids, your, your life is over. career is, it should stop or you should slow down or you should maneuver it. Like, I don't mind having two of my kids and we do like our own dance troupe. And you guys come on Instagram and you see us like always like doing some sort of choreography. Yeah. And then you see the behind the scenes where I'm yelling at one of them, hey, come here, what are you doing? You know, so it's you have to just like literally make the best of every moment. I'm not going to be that person who's so career driven. I am very driven. We've spoken about this from the beginning of the interview, well, no. but I will do both. Yeah, And you'll probably do both yeah. well. And I want tomorrow another girl who will see me. She'll say, I can also do both. Mm. So that's that's kind of how I thought about it. And I can't wait until that happens. Um, favorite color and three reasons why. Red. Why? Because it's a lucky color for me. Mm -hmm. Because the biggest things in my career have happened when I wore red. And the craziest thing have happened in my personal life when I wore red. So. <laughs> what was that? Um, it's just like crazy things. Met interesting people. Mm. Had fun. <laughs> but I think also red looks amazing on me. That's my color. <laughs> and if it seems like there are 10 stories that you don't want to say, so I'm not going to push under the color red. It seems like it's fun stories, though. Next time. Um, yeah, maybe part two. We've yeah. never done that, though. You never know. Uh, You'll do that. Favorite animal? It can be any kind, wild or not. And three reasons why. Oh, favorite animal. Mm. I never thought about that. Mm. The lion, because okay. of the Lion King. Mm. Two more. There's this puppy that you can put in a little bag because it's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> I always imagined I'd have like a purse, put a little puppy and it's like, hey guys, although I'm a little bit scared of dogs, but yeah, I love puppies. Um, a third one would be a bird just because of what it stands for. No, no, the lion, three reasons why you chose oh, a lion. Oh, the lion, I thought three, oh, but still no. now you know, it's bird no, know and lion. Listening. And three reasons why I, cho I chose a lion because it's fearless. Mm. Because of the power it invokes and its aura. Interesting. Yeah. So I'll explain those two. Okay, go for it. Color is how you see yourself. Okay. So uh, you said that the best things in your life has happened when we're red, uh, that it looks good on you. Uh, what was your first one? It's it, my groundbreaking career moments when yeah. I was wearing red. Yeah. And the animal? Is your ideal partner. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Aura, power. But how do you know it's the ideal partner and it's not what I see myself in? It's what you would probably get attracted to in a, in a partner. Interesting. Somebody who has uh, these characteristics. Anyways. So interesting. What makes you feel valuable? What do I feel? Okay. My friends make me feel valuable. Why? Um, because I think if I look back at my whole journey, I've always been blessed with good friends. Um, when I was in Canada, I've been blessed with amazing friends, supportive friends. And when I'm with them, whatever support I can give them and whatever the support they give to me, it makes me feel valuable. Like I have a purpose, kind of. You know, we help each other in problems. We're there for each other when shit hits the fan. And I've gone through so much shit in my life. So have they, mm. you know, and we've gone through shit together. But somehow we knew how to help each other, even though we were all going through the same thing. And for me, that is very valuable. Very. You know, I have a friend who I think was a guardian angel in disguise during my struggle for five years in India. Listen, I'm still struggling still. 
it's just a different kind of struggle, yes. you know. But that rough, rough struggle, this girl came out of nowhere, out of nowhere. I, tr- I kid you not. In the first year of me being in India, I had a, a health issue and I was being operated on. And it was so scary for me because I was, I didn't know like where I was. I was scared. I was like, what if they take my organs and they sell it? Like I was really scared. And I remember opening my eyes after the operation and I see this girl she's sitting right there. And I only seen her like twice because we used to go to auditions in the same car. She was in the same agency, but in another building. And she's sitting there and I was like, Isha? She's like, yeah, hey, I brought your toothbrush. I brought this, 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 this. I'm gonna be staying with you until like you get discharged. And I'm like, what? And she stayed with me the whole week that I was there. Nice. And she literally took care of me. I didn't know the girl. Like we were getting to know each other in the hospital. And I said, I'm adopting you. Like when we leave, you're gonna live with me and I'm gonna be with you till whenever. Mm. And she was, she was, she lived with me for five years. She was my soulmate. She still is one of my best friends. She's in the UK now. But what she did to me in those five years was what I was hungry for. The uplifting, the positivity. When I used to come home and cry because someone rejected me for a project or someone laughed at me in an audition, she would be there to be like, girl, why are you crying? Do you know who you are? You are Nora Fete. At that time, I was nobody, but still in the house between me and her, that uplifting would happen. She'd be like, don't cry because you're gonna, you're gonna show them who you are. Just wait when your time yeah. comes. And she used to uplift me and she used to hug me and she used to be there for me. And she used to let me cry when I needed to cry. And then she used to like pack me up when I needed to get packed up. So she, and subhanAllah, like when I became like, when I exploded, she went, she left, she went to the UK, she had to go back. I think people come to our lives for certain reasons and we are for them. She did. It's a, it's a duo. I don't know what I would have done without her, but she was my support and system. she needed you, by the way. That's yeah, why I say good, yeah. good relationships are mutual, win-win. Yeah. Um, I think tell me. I, God's taking care of me with good people. Yeah. My situations might be hard and difficult, but he always keeps good people around me. That's why I say with people, my friends, the value is there. Hmm. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of... I used to be afraid of rejection, but that's out the window now. (laughs) I've been rejected so many times. It's like, are you rejecting me? Thank you. Goodbye. Like, now I don't care about it. But I am afraid of not having an intact family. Intact. Yes. So, yeah, basically, I, I want to get married. I want to have kids. Then in the back of my head, that fear. What if? It breaks. I make a mistake. Mm. I choose the wrong person. What if it breaks? My kids, this, this. What if I repeat history? That's a big fear of mine. Best moment in your life so far? I've had too many. Give me one. I can't. That I have pops too, up. I've just, I have too many. Something nice. Something special, sentimental. You were so like joyous, very purely happy. Purely happy? Mm. It's when my, my work pops off. Like when my work pops off, I'm really happy. Okay. It's a sense of validation. Mm. It's also, you have to understand where I come from. For an, a, a billion people, or maybe plus, because I'm talking about India, but, but Indians are global, you know what I mean? And we add Arabs to it too. When people like that are accepting and supporting and loving and celebrating you, it's a huge thing. Like you can't fathom that. Mm. I don't have a backing. Like I don't have a big name behind me supporting me. I don't come from a filmy family. These are all things that help you elevate in an industry like Bollywood. I don't have any of that stuff. When you're doing well, it's only because the audience wants you and loves you. There's nothing, nothing more valuable than that in my field and more powerful than that. Because you know, in the end of the day, what's our target? It's the audience. So if the audience is saying we want you or we love you and we support you, and we understand you and we love what you do, it doesn't matter who's behind me, who's not behind me. It doesn't sure. matter what my last name is, what my last name isn't. And for me, that's so powerful. So when my songs do certain numbers, 
And when I go on internet and I see kids doing my hook steps and they're tagging me, they're like, Nora, man, look at me, look at me dance, like, look at what I can do. That's such a beautiful feeling, you have no idea. And that's why like, I wanna do my own academy. And that's why I wanna do my own brand. And one day, inshallah, when I do my brand, I want it to invoke determination, hope, positivity, self-love, all of that like together. And I will do that one day. You will. Um, worst moment in your life? I think the worst moment in my life was probably when I just, when it was just me and my brother suddenly like alone. I think that's the worst moment. Mm. It was really scary. And I think in that moment I felt helpless. I don't like that feeling. Like to feel helpless, it's not something someone like me can swallow because we are control freaks and we want to control everything and we want everything to be good and like suddenly you feel helpless mm -mm. not a nice feeling and i don't want to feel that again you know that's my word really? that's my answer really helpless because wow. i've been uh, somebody flipped in one of the interviews and they said what would you answer and i said at least two twice in my life i was helpless and i don't do well with that I didn't do well. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Um, do you forgive your parents? Yeah, of course. I, it was it meant to happen. It had to happen that way. If it didn't happen that way, I would not be who I am today. I would not be Nora Fatih. I would not be a star. I would have not had the courage to leave Canada, go to India and pursue my dreams. I wouldn't have that conviction because my circumstance would have been different. Hmm. Had my circumstance not been like that, I wouldn't be who I am today, period. So I, I'm very happy that that happened. And I don't regret anything. Um, India in one word. Sorry, India in one word? My life. Canada in one word. My past. Hmm. Um, one word would be life, past, yeah. And when I say life, I mean it like in the Arabic way, like Hayati, eh? it's my heart. Mm. Um, hypothetical question. Mm. <clears throat> we take uh, Nora's heart mm -hmm. with all that's been going through and we place it in front of you here. What would it tell you? It would tell you so many things. What would it tell you? It would tell me, calm down. Whatever you want, you're going to get. Just calm down. Mm. Believe in the process. Omar in one word. Who? Omar. Omar? How do you know Omar? Yo, that's my baby. <laughs> my love. What would you tell Omar if he watches this interview? Oh, he's still going to watch this for sure. He watches everything. He just mm. bought my merchandise the other day. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah, he just bought like... Um, so I have a song called Pepeta which I sang and produced, and he bought the, the phone case, and he sent it to me. He's like, yo, I'm gonna rock the Pippita phone case. I was like, yes. What, what would I tell him when he's watching this? I would tell Omar to follow his dreams, to believe, mm -hmm. and not let anything hold him back. Final. No run one word. Amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was nice. Thank you. You're getting emotional now. That was so nice. It was. Why are you crying? I think, um, it's funny. It's like in a good way. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. Hmm. It's a good thing. I know. Because mentally, there's a rewind that happens. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. so it's like intense. And you just look at like all the kind of people you meet. And then you're just like, the world is like, Vicious, <laughs> but it's also, I'll tell you why I cry, because I think about 
like other people, like girls, that maybe went through the same thing as me and probably gave up. Like it's so easy to give up. And I think about the kind of people I met who really brought me down, not in India, everywhere, even in Canada. You know, when I was just hustling and I look and I go, haram, like if any girl or even a guy would have gone through that, they would have just been shattered. They would have lost hope. Yani, like if a human loses hope, it's the worst thing. It's the worst thing. And I keep thinking, I'm like, that even 50% of the things I went through, if another girl or guy went through that and they lost hope, that would have been one more person in the world that we would have lost, could have been a great person. They could have made an impact in the world. They could have made a difference in the yeah. world. And I wish parents would instill hope and confidence and prepare them for what's out there. And I wish our school system did the same thing because everything I learned in school didn't help me for the real world. Mm -hmm. Metaphors and, and what type of rocks there are in the world and you know what happens when the, the plant hits the sun at 4 p.m. That shit didn't help me yeah. for the jungle. And I always think about the necessary about like the necessity of your upbringing at home instead of our uh, parents like when I say our I say globally anybody instead of them being so La, don't do this don't wear this don't go out don't talk to this don't do this study don't watch this don't instead of being like that I wish they would prepare them for the world prepare them for marriage prepare them for what it is to be uh, with another human, what it is to share a life with another human, prepare them for what it is to, uh, to, 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 to work, to go and work for yourself and to create an identity. Prepare, prepare them for the workforce. The workforce is not an easy place. The kind of things women and men face, we don't, we're not prepared for that. And two things happen, either they ruin you for life or they make you for life. But most of the time, they ruin you for mm. life. They break you. They ruin your personality, your charisma, your aura. They make you negative. And you are the same person who will have kids and you will inject that negativity to the next lot. Yeah. You know, I think about this every day. So I think about this whole journey I told you. I think about the whole thing. And I'm like, subhanAllah, how God written all that for me, for this. And how we are like literally nothing. We have no control of what is written for us and why things happen for us. And I look at like, I give you another example. When I popped off, when my career started, I was so scared. I said, what if this is 15 minutes of fame? Or what if I don't find a manager who's good hearted, who can guide me and make things happen, who will open doors for me? Because this is a fear for a lot of artists. It's very rare you find good people in your team. And I was really scared of that. And subhanAllah, like I've, like Amin, like my Moroccan manager, he came out of nowhere. <laughs> he came out of nowhere, nowhere. He lives in Morocco, I live in India. And how we met, and he came at the right time. And he's such a good soul. And he uplifted me and he pushed me and he made things happen. And he became protective. These are the things I was looking for. And I didn't find for many, many years. And when I saw that my career is going well and things are happening, I had a fear of what if I don't find someone who won't use me for money, who won't see me as an ATM machine, who won't, yeah. who won't, who won't use me for some time and throw me. Many, many artists go through this. Mm. And I cry because I, I say, Alhamdulillah, that despite all the things, God brings me good people all the time. And pe having good people around you is very rare. So that's why. Right. Yeah. Believe me, I know. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>